Welcome to the second subpart of the uh, first module. Um, in this lecture, I'm going to be introducing some of the software we're going to be using and encouraging you to download some of the software so you can use it yourself. Uh, as I said, we're using mostly free tools and fairly simple pieces of software, and I'll make some recommendations about um, what which ones might work best for you. Uh, again, I'll be using, uh, I think in the video here at least, I'll be using uh, uh, a Windows system, a Vista system, but uh, I will uh, try to uh, provide some examples of, of uh, Mac uh, applications that you can use as well and give you a feel for how those might differ. Um, generally speaking, however, uh, they're the same no matter which system you're using, Mac or PC. Uh, so let's start with the first of these. Uh, I'm recommending you use Firefox. If you don't have the most uh, recent uh, version of Firefox, which is 3, um, go ahead to getfirefox.com and, and you can download Firefox 3. If you're in the program, you're probably already using Firefox. Uh, why Firefox? Well, one reason is that it tends to be more standards compliant than at least Inter Internet Explorer, um, which is the Microsoft uh, browser. It, uh, no browser is entirely, there's no one that's kind of the clear gold standard. However, <laughs> Firefox tends to do things a little bit better. You should really have a number of, of different browsers at your command so that you can test your designs in various browsers. Different browsers on different computers render the same website in very different ways in some cases. Um, this includes things like, for example, your PDA. What, is it, you know, what does your page look like when someone pulls it up on a PDA? Does it look the way you want it to look? Um, obviously, they're going to look different from, from uh, browser to browser, from from platform to platform, and so it's a good idea to have a good collection of those. So that's not really the reason we're using Firefox. The main reason is that we want to use an add-on to Firefox called Firebug. When you install Firebug, you'll see that if you go to the page, there's a little button that just says, if you're if you're visiting the page in Firefox, obviously, um, there's a little button that says um, uh, Add to Firefox right there in the middle. And if you click on that, it'll add it in, and you'll have a little um, bug in the corner of your of your page in the lower right hand corner and if you click on the lower right hand corner you'll see that you'll be able to um, look at the CSS, the HTML, um, any scripts that happen to be on the page um, and a number of other things that are useful uh, to understand kind of what's going on uh, uh, on a page and be able to alter it which can be extraordinarily useful. So we're going to uh, be using this when we start to talk about HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and so you need to download that and make sure it's there. One of the technologies we're going to be using pretty centrally to this course is Folksonomic or uh, bookmarking technologies. You've probably heard of um, a, uh, a site called Delicious, and if you haven't, um, let me show you what it is real quick, um, or, or you may have actually used it. It's a way of taking the bookmarks that sometimes you save in a browser, URLs that you want to return to later, and storing them somewhere public. Uh, and the trick is, when you store them somewhere public, not only can you get at them from any computer, but you can also um, allow others to see what you're bookmarking, and that's a nice way of sharing content with your friends or with a, a wider public. There's lots of alternatives to, to Delicious. There's a site called Magnolia. There's a, a site called Furl. Uh, many of these are very good. Um, we're trying a, a, a new one here called Digo. Digo allows you to, um, to bookmark sites, just like Delicious does. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. You just kind of go to the site, click Join Now. And once you join, um, it'll give you a plug-in that once again you can add to Firefox. So when you add this plugin to Firefox, you'll get this up here. Let me sign in real quick. When you're signed in, you'll have a, a whole set of things you can do up here in your browser. So um, let's go ahead and bookmark a site. Um, let's go to webpro, whoops, prog.haliday.net. And this is the site for the class, of course. And let's go ahead and take a look at the um, at the the first of these uh, pages. And this is the the syllabus page. This is actually from oops, no, this isn't it. Um, the course introduction, which is kind of a syllabus page that we've uh, that you've already seen. And as you can see, I, what if I wanted to save this for later? Well, I can go up here and just hit bookmark, and it pops up a window. 
and in this window I can say what I want to say about this this page so I can say this is a syllabus for what appears to be the coolest class ever so I give a quick description I could do a little bit more than that I doubt you'll ever really hit that 2000 character mark but at least you know give some summary as to the reason that, I, that you're bookmark bookmarking it um, this is important for yourself but in particularly in this class you need to say something about it this is probably a little too short I might want to kind of go into more detail um, on some of the assignments you're asked to say quite a bit in here um, but just something that's freeform text that is associated with this and then there's tags now for things that are for the class, I'm going to ask you to use the webprog tag. Um, and I might say something like syllabus. I might say something like courses. I might say something like um, web programming. Note here that there's spaces separating the tags, so web programming has to have this little underscore there so that we know that it's one single tag. And because you know it's somehow associated to me I might use Halive as a tag on this as well now I can also click this and say share to a group let's see if we can run this off the screen for us share to a group and I have a group called webprog that's the group that you're going to be a part of and I can add a comment for the group hey everyone check out this syllabus so I can save so now I've, I've bookmarked this page. That's great. It allows me to bookmark. And as you see, we have a, a group that you're going to be a part of. Take a look at the syllabus section. It says you know, something about this. And chances are, if you're enrolled in one of the courses at Quinnipiac, you've received an invitation from me to join Digo already. Um, and so you may already have had a chance to play around with it. Be sure you join the group called WebProg if you haven't already. So I've just bookmarked that and made it part of WebProg. This, Digo has another neat function. Um, I'm going to go down to a section here about um, course structure, schedule. Um, look real quick and let's say I wanted to submitting challenges for it via Digo. This has, talks a little bit about this and you've already run across it, but let's say I wanted to um, comment on something or I had a question. You need to set up an account. Um, let's say I wanted to highlight that and you'll see that it highlights it so next time I come back here it, I'll see that highlighting that might be convenient if you're used to using highlighting anyway also other people in the group might be able to see it now let's say I wanted to do more than that I can actually highlight and if you see the little drop here I can highlight and comment and then I can make a private comment so I just see it to my, myself later on or I can add it to my group so everybody in the group when they visit this site will see my comment and my comment is simply is, is simply uh, what do I do to join the group this is a great way to ask a question right so I can just say okay and now anybody that comes here will see that little pop-up sticky note when they visit the site so that's a little add-on beyond just bookmarking um, and as we go through the semester, if it looks a little confusing now, don't worry. The first time you use it, you might kind of struggle through it, and then you'll start to feel, get a feel for how this can be used. Secondly, we're going to need to upload and download files from the server. Traditionally, you do that using something called File Transfer Protocol, FTP. Uh, you may already have an FTP client on your computer. In fact, you probably do, whether or not you know you do. But let's go ahead and get a more friendly uh, FTP client. We're going to use something called uh, FireZilla, um, which is a, uh, an FTP client that works, in, um, that works in both Windows, on bo both Windows systems and, um, did I say FileZilla? Yes, both Windows systems and um, Macs and obviously uh, Linux systems. And you want to download, if you go to the page, the client and not the server, because we're going to be using this to transfer to an FTP server, um, to your web server, which is also probably contacted through an FTP. So you need to download the FileZilla client. Actually, um, uploading and downloading things on FileZilla is really quite simple. Let me start it up real quick. 
Um, if you go to, if you open up the window, you'll see that you have um, a, a host where you can type in where your host is and your username and password for that host. Um, I'll go ahead and connect to um, one of my servers. Um, and uh, you'll see that as you connect, it kind of has some files on the left-hand side and some files on the right-hand side. The ones on the left-hand side, this is at least in the default view, are the ones on your computer. And the ones on the right-hand side are the ones on the server, on the other computer. And you transfer files simply by clicking them and dragging them from one side over to the other side. So let's find a file over here. And we'll go ahead and click on it. And we can drag it over to our server. And now it does a quick transfer thing, and it moves the file up onto the server. This is vital. We absolutely need this to be able to put things on a server. So if you have an FTP client you already like, that's great. Go ahead and make use of that. Uh, otherwise, go ahead and download FileZilla, and you can use that as your FTP client. We're also going to be doing a lot of text editing. Now, a quick note, a text editor is not the same as a word processor. Um, a word processor is designed to create printed documents, and we aren't going to be doing printed documents. We want to actually make text files. Um, on uh, there's There are already existing text editors on uh, in your computer if you have a Mac or a PC or, or, or a Windows machine or just about any operating system comes with a basic text editor so for the PC you probably run into notepad and maybe wordpad both of those can edit plain text documents wordpad can actually act as a word processor as well but um, it's also a pretty good plain text um, plain text document uh, text editor uh, and also uh, OS 10 comes with uh, text edit um, that allows you to do plain text editing. You need to make sure you're actually doing plain text editing last with WordPad. Um, these are both fine, all, all three fine programs. They work for what we need to do, but you'll find that they can they can catch you up in bad ways sometimes. And and there are some useful, very small improvements that are very useful. Um, and some of these text editors actually can be kind of super, super programs and do all sorts of things. But even the very small improvements of, of replacement editors are useful. I'm going to recommend that if you are, um, uh, if you are uh, going to be uh, using a Windows machine, that you use a program called uh, Notepad++. As you can see, it, it does some, some things that might be useful down here. Um, there's another program called Notebook 2, which I often use as well. Either of those will do nicely uh, for Windows. And if you're using uh, Mac, you might want to try Text Wrangler or possibly sim uh, something called Smoltron. Both of these are, are programs that are replacement text editors that are particularly useful for doing programming and doing web production. And so I would recommend that you uh, bring one of these in. Uh, I'll show you TextPad 2, or rather, rather Notepad 2. One of the advantages is a very simple advantage, which is that it um, is that it gives you line numbers. And when you're debugging, it's very useful to have things like line numbers. They can handle much larger files. There's lots of, lots of reasons that these are, are useful uh, programs to be running. Those are the vital, those are the kind of the uh, four vital things that you need. You need to have Firebug installed for the, for the class. You need to have Digo set up. You need to have an FTP client. And you should have, not, vi not as vital, but you should have a text editor. These next two are kind of up to you, and I'm going to show them to you so you know what they are. The first is called VNC, Virtual Network Computing. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, recommend that you um, use a, a, a particular client, a VNC client and server called Tight. I'm sorry, yes, Tight VNC is what we're going to use. Um, and there are a number of them. In fact, there's there's some that are that are faster than Type VNC, uh, but Type VNC tends to has been around for a while and and uh, tends to be the most sort of consistent, um, particularly if you don't have a super fast connection. So um, let me explain a little bit about what VNC is. Uh, VNC is uh, stands for Virtual Network Computer, and what it means is that I'm able to look to open up a window and look on your computer, not unless you let me. Not unless you give me a password and you start up the server and you say, you're on the phone with me and you say, I want you to look at this. That's the only time I can get access to it. But if in those cases, it's very useful for me to actually, actually be able to see what you're doing. So VNC is useful for that, for you to be able to phone me up and say, Alex, I'm having a problem with this program. And instead of trying to either 
copy and paste the program to a place where I can see it, or reading me the program or telling me what you see on your screen, I can actually kind of look over your shoulder and see what you're typing and see what's going on with your computer. That's a very useful thing. The downside to this is that, um, is that VNC can be a little more difficult to work with if you have a wireless router or a non-wireless router, any kind of router on your home network. If your computer is directly connected to the modem for uh, your cable modem, for example, or your DSL modem, then that's great. But if you have a wireless network, then we have to do some extra bits and pieces. And I've linked to somewhere that talks a little bit about port forwarding on the site. I'm not going to get into that here because, frankly, I don't want to freak you out, and it can be a very frustrating process if you if it can be, it can be very easy as well, but it can be a frustrating process if you're not familiar with this stuff. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, at least consider installing, getting an install of VNC just because it'll make it easier down the road if I need to talk to you about things. The other thing that you'll want to be doing is capturing, um, capturing either uh, video or um, still images from your website when you do. Uh, when you do a tutorial. Now, you may end up not doing any tutorials at all. It may be that um, you know you decide not to do those challenges. But if you do, one of the requirements is that you show some visual indication of, of what people should do. And so one thing you could do is just kind of click uh, Control Print Screen, and that will put the the current image on the on the on the uh, clipboard so you can then bring that into Photoshop and manipulate it. That's a fine thing to do. In fact, you'll find that even though I'll be recording some screenshots when I'm doing stuff here, some of them are just plain non-video screenshots and that's fine. The other thing you can try is using Jing and uh, there are lots of programs that do, that do video screen capture. I'll probably be using Camtasia a lot in this, this semester or one of the other possibilities. Some of them are free as well. Um, but there's lots of things you can do to kind of capture video images online. Uh, Jing is a neat little project just because it very quickly allows you to capture some window on your screen and then share it immediately. And because of that, I would strongly recommend you go ahead and take a look at that. Um, and uh, there's a video tour on the site. I almost included in, it's, I almost thought about including that in this video, but I figure um, since it's optional, you can kind of go to that site and decide whether you want to um, download and use that. Again, that's for um, either for the Mac or for, for a Windows machine. As a final note, you'll find a, a conspicuous missing piece of software here, which is Dreamweaver. Um, I don't, I don't uh, dislike uh, web authoring software. I've used Dreamweaver as well as GoLive and a number of others. Um, and there is a really interesting range of software tools that are able to help you write good HTML and, and help you with CSS. Um, and it is, in some cases, easier to use Dreamweaver, for example, to do CSS designs from scratch. However, um, you end up using that as a crutch. And that would be bad enough as it is, but um, it's particularly bad when later on you're going to have to ask the computer to write HTML. And if you don't know how to write HTML, you're not going to be able to program a computer to write HTML. And so this is a, one of those kinds of decisions that, that I've taught web design before in both ways, both using uh, Dreamweaver and before that go live and doing it with a text editor. And uh, and there are advantages and disadvantages to both. It's a little bit like the difference between uh, teaching Carpentry using power tools from the outset or using hand tools to begin with. And so there's something frustrating about using hand tools because it doesn't, you know, produce something immediately that looks beautiful. Um, uh, simple maybe, but not beautiful uh, in kind of a fancy way, and power tools might let you do that. Uh, but if you learn to use hand tools well, you become also an expert user of power tools. And so my hope is that during this semester you'll really have a very good uh, understanding of how HTML is structured, how CSS should be used and can be used, and then from there you can make judicious use of Dreamweaver and of other, other kinds of applications uh, that help you to produce websites. Uh, however, uh, I think that you'll find that understanding HTML first makes you a much better user of those applications. Um, so we won't be using them here. Uh, I can't tell if you're using them um, particularly, but I'm going to strongly encourage you 
not to use them. And if you produce code that's bad because you are using them, and frankly there are some bad things it does with the code, um, depending on which one you're using and how you're using it, uh, then that will be not good. Is that a, a, ambiguous enough for you? Um, we're going to be doing some very simple projects, and so uh, these these applications will largely get in the way of some of the things we're trying to do in the course. Um, so I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying I don't like them. I'm not say, even saying that I don't use them. I am saying that, uh, that it is mu a much better skill to have to be able to write HTML and write CSS and JavaScript um, and program um, from the code level, at the most basic level. And so that's what our focus is during this semester. And so not on this list are, are those tools that will kind of, from the very easy ones that kind of do code completion, that let you choose from tags, to those that are more complicated and, and basically are what you see or kind of what you get, um, editors like Dreamweaver. Um, so that's not on our list. All right, see you on the next module.